Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 15 I Strike the Jolly Roger I had scarce gained a position on the bowsprit when the flying jib flapped and filled on the other tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but the next moment, the other sails still drawing, the jib flapped back again and hung idle. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea, and now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit, and tumbled head foremost on the deck. I was on the lee side of the forecastle, and the mainsail, which was still drawing, concealed me from a certain portion of the after-deck. Not a soul was to be seen. The planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet, and an empty bottle, broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. Suddenly the Hispaniola came right into the wind. The jibs behind me cracked aloud, the rudder slammed to, the whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder and at the same moment the main boom swung inboard, the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after-deck. There were the two watchmen, sure enough, red cap on his back, as stiff as a handspike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix, and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel hands propped against the bulwarks, his chin on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under his tan as a tallow candle. For a while the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling now on one tack, now on another, and the boom swinging to and fro till the mast groaned aloud under the strain. Now and again, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays under the bulwark, and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell. So much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my home-made lopsided coracle, now gone to the bottom of the sea. At every jump of the schooner Red Cap slipped to and fro, but, what was ghastly to behold, neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth-disclosing grin was in any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump, too, hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck, his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting toward the stern, so that his face became, little by little, hid from me. And at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. At the same time I observed, around both of them, splashes of dark blood upon the planks and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering, in a calm moment when the ship was still, Israel Hands turned partly round, and, with a low moan, writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness, and the way in which his jaw hung open, went right to my heart but when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple-barrel, all pity left me. I walked aft until I reached the mainmast. "'Come aboard, Mr. Hands,' I said ironically. He rolled his eyes round heavily, but he was far too gone to express surprise. All he could do was utter one word, "'Brandy!' It occurred to me that there was no time to lose and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped aft and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy. All the lock-fast places had been broken open in quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud where the ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozens of empty bottles clinked together in corners to the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table, half of the leaves gutted out, I suppose, for pipe-lights. In the midst of all this the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone, and of the bottles a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away. 
Certainly, since the mutiny began, not a man of them could ever have been sober. Foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left, for hands. And for myself, I routed out some biscuit, some pickled fruits, a great bunch of raisins, and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder head, and, well out of the coxswain's reach, went forward to the water-breaker, and had a good, deep drink of water, and then, not until then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a jill before he took the bottle from his mouth. "'Aye,' said he, "'by thunder, but I wanted some of that.' And he sat down already in my corner, and began to eat. "'Much hurt?' I asked him. He grunted, or rather, I might say he barked. "'If that doctor was a bald, he said, "'I'd be right enough in a couple of turns, but I don't have no manner of luck, you see. That's what's the matter with me. And for that swab, he's good and dead he is,' he added, indicating the man with the red cap. "'He weren't no seaman anyhow. And where might you have come from?' "'Well,' said I, "'I have come aboard to take possession of the ship, Mr. Hands, and you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice.' He looked at me sourly enough, but said nothing. Some of the colour had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick, and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. "'By the by,' I continued, "'I can't have these colours, Mr. Hands, and by your leave I'll strike em. Better none than these.' And, again dodging the boom, I ran to the colour lines, and hauled down their cursed black flag, and chucked it overboard. "'God save the King,' said I, waving my cap, "'and there's an end to Captain Silver.' He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. "'I reckon,' he said at last, "'I reckon, Captain Hawkins, you'll kind of want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks.' "'Why, yes,' says I, "'with all my heart, Mr. Hands, say on.' And I went back to my meal with a good appetite. "'This man,' he began, nodding feebly at the corpse. "'O'Brien was his name. A rank islander. This man and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sail her back. Well, he's dead now, he is, as dead as bilge. And who's to sail this ship, I don't see? Without, I'll give you a hint, you ain't that man, as far as I can tell. Now, look here. You gives me food and drink, and an old scarf or handkerchief, to tie my wound up, you do, and I'll tell you how to sail her. And that's about square all round, I take it. I'll tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why, I ain't sich an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost, and it's you as the wind of me. North Inlet? Why, I haven't no choice, not I. I'd a help you sail her up to execution dock, by thunder, so I would. Well, as it seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island, with good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon, and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water, when we might beach her safely, and wait until the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller, and went below to my own chest, where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this, and with my aid, hands bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh, and after he had eaten a little, and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he began to pick up visibly, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by, and the view changing every minute. 
Soon we were past the highlands and bowling beside low sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines, and soon we were beyond that again, and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command, and pleased with the bright sunshiny weather, and these different prospects of the coast. I now had plenty of water and good things to eat, and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the coxswain as they followed me derisively about the deck, and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness a haggard old man's smile. But there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery, in his expression as he craftily watched and watched and watched me at my work. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Israel Hands The wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor, and dared not beach her until the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. "'Cap'n,' said he, at length, with that same uncomfortable smile, "'Ere's my old shipmate O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash. But I don't reckon him ornamental now, do you?' "'I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. And there he lies for me,' said I. "'Ere's an unlucky ship, the Hispaniola, Jim,' he went on, blinking. There's a power of men been killed on this Hispaniola, a sight of poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took this ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien now, he's dead, ain't he? Well, now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure. And to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good, or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hands, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world, and may be watching us. Ah, says he, well, that's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now you spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'll step down into that there cabin and get me a—well, a, well, a shiver my timbers, I can't hit the name on't. Well, you can get me a bottle of wine, Jim. This here brandy's too strong for my head. Now the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural and, as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain, but with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in a most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that, with a fellow so densely stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. "'Some wine?' I said. "'Far better. Will you have white or red?' "'Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate,' he replied. "'So it's strong, and plenty of it. What's the odds?' "'All right,' I answered. "'I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it, 
and with that I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers, and picked up a coil of rope with a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discoloured to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about. He was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What would he do afterward? whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might first come to help him, was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point, since in that our interests jumped together, and that was the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough, in a sheltered place, so that when the time came she could be got off again with as little labour and danger as might be, and until that was done I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine, and now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle, and with his eyelids lowered, as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig, with his favourite toast of, "'Ears luck!' Then he lay quiet for a little, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. "'Cut me a junk of that,' says he, "'for I haven't no knife, and hardly the strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, oh, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid as likely to be the last, lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake.' "'Well,' said I, "'I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you, and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man. Why? said he. Now you tell me why. Why? I cried. You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this very moment, and you ask me why? For God's mercy, Mr. Hands, that's why. I spoke with a little heat thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket, and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine, and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. "'For thirty year,' he said, "'I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going, and what not. Well, now I tell you, I never seen good come out of goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views. Amen. So be it. And now you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. We've had enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. 
I think I was a good prompt subaltern, and I am sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about, and dodged in, shaving the banks, with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the head before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower, and more like what in truth it was the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the decks of it shore bushes had taken root, and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now said Hans. Look there! There's a pet bit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw, trees all around of it, and flowers are blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so, he replied. You take a line ashore there on the other side at low water, take a turn about one of them big pines, bring it back, take a turn around the capstan, and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We've hit the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little. So, steady, starboard, larboard a little, steady, steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till, all of a sudden, he cried, Now, my hearty, laugh! And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly, and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgotten the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks, and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life, had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me, and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak, or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct, like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans, already half-way toward me, with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met. But while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bull's. At the same instant he threw himself forward, and I leapt sideways toward the bows. As I did so I let go of the tiller, which sprung sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest, and stopped him for the moment dead. Before he could recover I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with sea-water. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had I not, long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been as now a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move, his grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed in the bows, as a moment since he had so neatly boxed me in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of a goodish bigness, 
and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home, about the rocks of Blackhill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say it, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had began to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope in any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side, till the deck stood at an angle of forty-five degrees, and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper-holes, and lay in a pool between the deck and the bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had found some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross-trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight, and there stood Israel Hands with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol, and then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other, and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him, and, after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and, with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. "'One more step, Mr. Hands,' said I, "'and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know,' I added, with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the workings of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that, in my new-found security, I laughed out loud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but, in all else, he remained unmoved. "'Jim,' says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch. But I don't have no luck, not I, and I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a walk, when all in a breath back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow, and then a sharp pang, and there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I am sure it was without a conscious aim. Both of my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grasp upon the shrouds, and plunged head first into the water. End of chapter 26
by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 27 Pieces of Eight Owing to the cant of the vessel, the masts hung far out over the water, and from my perch on the cross-trees I had nothing below me but the surface of the bay. Hands, who was not so far up, was in consequence nearer to the ship, and fell between me and the bulwarks. He rose once to the surface in a lather of foam and blood, and then sank again for good. As the water settled I could see him lying huddled together on the clean bright sand in the shadow of the vessel's sides. A fish or two whipped past his body. Sometimes by the quivering of the water he appeared to move a little, as if he were trying to rise, but he was dead enough for all that, being both shot and drowned, and was food for fish in the very place where he had designed my slaughter. I was no sooner certain of this than I began to feel sick, faint, and terrified. The hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk, where it had pinned my shoulder to the mast, seemed to burn like a hot iron. Yet it was not so much these real sufferings that distressed me, for these, it seemed to me, I could bear without a murmur. It was the horror that I had upon my mind of falling from the cross-tree into that still green water beside the body of the coxswain. I clung with both hands till my nails ached, and I shut my eyes as if to cover up the peril. Gradually my mind came back again. My pulses quieted down to a more natural time, and I was once more in possession of myself. It was my first thought to pluck forth the dirk, but either it struck too hard or my nerve failed me, and I desisted with a violent shudder. Oddly enough, that very shudder did the business. The knife, in fact, had come the nearest in the world to missing me altogether. It held me by a mere pinch of skin, and this the shudder tore away. The blood ran down the faster, to be sure, but I was my own master again, and only tacked to the mast by my coat and shirt. These last I broke through with a sudden jerk, and then regained the deck by the starboard shrouds, for nothing in the world would I have again ventured, shaken as I was, upon the overhanging port shrouds from which Israel had so lately fallen. I went below and did what I could for my wound. It pained me a good deal, and still bled freely, but it was neither deep nor dangerous, nor did it greatly gall me when I used my arm. Then I looked around me, and as the ship was now in a sense my own, I began to think of clearing it from its last passenger, the dead man O'Brien. He had pitched, as I have said, against the bulwarks, where he lay like some horrid, ungainly sort of puppet. Life-size, indeed, but how different from life's colour or life's comeliness! In that position I could easily have my way with him, and as the habit of tragical adventures had worn off almost all my terror for the dead, I took him by the waist, as if he'd been a sack of bran, and with one good heave tumbled him overboard. He went in with a sounding plunge. The red cap came off, and remained floating on the surface, and as soon as the splash subsided I could see him and Israel lying side by side, both wavering with the tremulous movement of the water. O'Brien, though still quite a young man, was very bald. There he lay with that bald head across the knees of the man who had killed him and the quick fishes steering to and fro over both. I was now alone within the ship. The tide had just turned. The sun was within so few degrees of setting that already the shadows of the pines upon the western shore began to reach right across the anchorage and fall in patterns on the deck. The evening breeze had sprung up, and though it was well warded off by the hill with the two peaks upon the east, the cordage had begun to sing a little softly to itself, and the idle sails to rattle to and fro. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck, but the mainsail was a harder matter. 
Of course, when the schooner canted over, the boom had swung outward, and the cap of it, and a foot or two of sail, hung even under water. I thought this made it still more dangerous, yet the strain was so heavy that I half feared to meddle. At last I got my knife, and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly, the great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water, and since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul, that was the extent of what I could accomplish. For the rest, the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. By this time the whole anchorage had fallen into shadow, the last rays, I remember, falling through a glade of the wood, and shining bright as jewels on the flowery mantle of the wreck. It began to be chill. The tide was rapidly fleeting seaward, the schooner settling more and more on her beam ends. I scrambled forward and looked over. It seemed shallow enough, and holding the cut hawser in both hands for a last security, I let myself drop softly overboard. The water scarcely reached my waist, the sand was firm and covered with ripple marks, and I waded ashore in great spirits, leaving the Hispaniola on her side, with her mainsail trailing wide upon the surface of the bay. About the same time the sun went fairly down, and the breeze whistled low in the dusk among the tossing pines. At least, and at last, I was off the sea, nor had I returned thence empty-handed. There lay the schooner, clear at last from buccaneers, and ready for our own men to board and get to sea again. I had nothing nearer my fancy than to get home to the stockade and boast of my achievements. Possibly I might be blamed a bit for my truanty, but the recapture of the Hispaniola was a clinching answer, and I hoped that even Captain Smollett would confess I had not lost my time. So thinking, and in famous spirits, I began to set my face homeward for the blockhouse and my companions. I remembered that the most easterly of the rivers, which drain into Captain Kidd's anchorage, ran from the two-peaked hill upon my left, and I bent my course in that direction, that I might pass the stream while it was small. The wood was pretty open, and keeping along the lower spurs, I had soon turned the corner of that hill, and not long after waded to the mid-calf across the watercourse. This brought me near to where I had encountered Ben Gunn, the maroon, and I walked more circumspectly, keeping an eye on every side. The dusk had come nigh hand completely, and, as I opened out of the cleft between the two peaks, I became aware of a wavering glow against the sky where, as I judged, the man of the island was cooking his supper before a roaring fire. And yet I wondered in my heart that he should show himself so careless, for if I could see this radiance, might it not reach the eye of silver himself, where he camped upon the shore among the marshes? Gradually the night fell blacker. It was all I could do to guide myself even roughly toward my destination. The double hill behind me, and the spyglass on my right hand loomed fainter and fainter. The stars were few and pale, and in the low ground where I wandered I kept tripping among bushes and rolling into sandy pits. Suddenly a kind of brightness fell about me. I looked up. A pale glimmer of moonbeams had alighted on the summit of the spyglass and soon after I saw something broad and silvery moving low down behind the trees, and knew the moon had risen. With this to help me I passed rapidly over what remained to me of my journey, and, sometimes walking, sometimes running, impatiently drew near to the stockade. Yet, as I began to thread the grove that lies before it, I was not so thoughtless but that I slacked my pace and went a trifle warily. It would have been a poor end of my adventures to get shot down by my own party in mistake. The moon was climbing higher and higher. Its light began to fall here and there in masses through the more open districts of the wood, and right in front of me a glow of a different colour appeared among the trees. It was red and hot, and now and again it was a little darkened, as it were the embers of a bonfire smouldering. For the life of me I could not think what it might be. 
At last I came right down upon the borders of the clearing. The western end was already steeped in moonshine, the rest, and the blockhouse itself, still lay in a black shadow, chequered with long silvery streaks of light. On the other side of the house an immense fire had burned itself into clear embers, and shared a steadily red reverberation, contrasting strongly with the mellow paleness of the moon. There was not a soul stirring, nor a sound beside the noises of that breeze. I stopped with much wonder in my heart, and perhaps a little terror also. It had not been our way to build great fires. We were indeed, by the captain's orders, somewhat niggardly of firewood, and I began to fear that something had gone wrong while I was absent. I stole round by the eastern end, keeping close in shadow, and, at a convenient place where the darkness was thickest, crossed the palisade. To make assurance surer, I got upon my hands and knees, and crawled without a sound toward the corner of the house. As I drew nearer my heart was suddenly and greatly lightened. It was not a pleasant noise in itself, and I have often complained of it in other times, but just then it was like music to hear my friends snoring together so loud and peaceful in their sleep. The sea-cry of the watch, that beautiful all's well, never fell more reassuring me on my ear. In the meantime there was no doubt of one thing. They kept an infamous bad watch. If it had been Silver and his lads that were now creeping in on them, not a soul would have seen daybreak. That was what it was, thought I, to have the captain wounded. And again I blamed myself sharply for leaving them in that danger, with so few to mount guard. By this time I had got to the door and stood up. All was dark within, so that I could distinguish nothing by the eye. As for sounds, there was the steady drone of the schnorrers, and a small occasional noise, a flickering or pecking, that I could in no way account for. With my arms before me, I walked steadily in. I should lie down in my own place, I thought with a silent chuckle, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. My foot struck something yielding. It was a sleeper's leg, and he turned and groaned, but without awaking. And then, all of a sudden, a shrill voice broke forth out of the darkness. "'Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! and so forth, without pause or change, like the clacking of a tiny mill. Silver's green parrot! Captain Flint! It was she whom I had heard pecking at a piece of bark! It was she keeping better watch than any human being who thus announced my arrival with her wearisome refrain. I had no time left me to recover. At the sharp clicking tone of the parrot the sleepers awoke and sprang up, and with a mighty oath the voice of Silver cried, "'Who goes?' I turned to run, struck violently against one person, recoiled, and ran full into the arms of a second, who, for his part, closed upon and held me tight. "'Bring a torch, Dick,' said Silver, when my capture was thus assured. And one of the men left the log-house, and presently returned with a lighted brand." End of chapter 27 Part 6 Captain Silver Chapter 28 In the Enemy's Camp The bright glare of the torch lighting up the interior of the blockhouse showed me the worst of my apprehensions realized. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores, there was the cask of cognac, there were the pork and bread as before, and what tenfold increased my horror not a sign of any prisoner. I could only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet, flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The sixth had only risen upon his elbow. He was deadly pale, and the blood-stained bandage round his head told that he had recently been wounded, and was still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and run back among the woods in the great attack, and doubted not that this was he. 
The parrot sat, preening her plumage, on Long John's shoulder. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore his fine broadcloth suit, in which he had fulfilled his mission, but it was bitterly the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Hawkins shiver my timbers, dropped in like, eh? Well, come, I take that friendly. And thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask and began to fill a pipe. Give me the loan of a link, Dick, said he, and then, when he had a good light, I'll do, my lad, he added, stick the glim in the wood heap. And you, gentlemen, bring yourselves to. You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. He'll excuse you. You may lay to that. And so, Jim, stopping the tobacco, here you are, and quite a pleasant surprise for old John. I see you were smart when first I set my eyes on you. But this here gets away from me clean, it do. To all this, as may be well supposed, I made no answer. They had set me with my back against the wall, and I stood there looking silver in the face, pluckily enough, I hope, to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe, with great composure, and then ran on again. "'Now you see, Jim, so be as you are here,' said he. I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you I have for a lad of spirit, and the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted to join and take your share and die a gentleman, and now, my cock, you've got to. Captain Smollett to find seamen, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the cap'n. The doctor himself is gone dead again you. Ungrateful scamp, was what he said. And the short and the long of the whole story is about here. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you. And without you start a third ship's company all by yourself, which might be lonely, You'll have to join with Captain Silver. So far, so good. My friends then were still alive, and though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement that the cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, though there you are, and you may lay to it. I more for argument. I never seen good come out a threatening. If you like the service, well, you're join. And if you don't, Jim, why, you're free to answer no. Free and welcome, shipmate. And if fairer can be said by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. Am I to answer then? I asked with a very tremulous voice. Through all this sneering talk I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned and my heart beat painfully in my breast. "'Lad,' said Silver, "'no one's a pressin' of you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see.' "'Well,' says I, growing a bit bolder, "'if I'm to choose—' I declare I have a right to know what's what, and why you're here, and where my friends are." "'What's what?' repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Uh, "'He'd be a lucky one as know that. You're perhaps batten down your arches till you are spoken to, my friend,' cried Silver truculently to the speaker. And then, in his first gracious tones, he replied to me. "'Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins,' said he, "'in the dog-watch, down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone.' 
"'Well, maybe we'd been taking a glass and a song to help it round. I won't say no. Leastways, none of us had looked out. We looked out, and by thunder the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack of fools look fishier, and you may lay to that, if I tells you that I look the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained him and I, and here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut, and in a manner of speaking the whole blessed boat from cross trees to keelson. As for them they've tramped, I don't know where's they are. He drew again quietly at his pipe. And lest you should take it into that head of yours, he went on, that you was included in the treaty, here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave? Four, says he, four, and one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is, confound him, says he, nor I don't much care. We're about sick of him, there was, was his words. "'Is that all?' I asked. "'Well, it's all you're to hear, my son,' returned Silva. "'And now I, I am to choose?' "'And now you are to choose, and you may lay to that,' said Silva. "'Well,' said I, "'I am not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst. It's little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you, I said, and by this time I was quite excited. And the first is this. Here you are, in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost, your whole business gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, it was I— I was in the apple-barrel that night we sighted land, and heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea, and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I who killed the men you had aboard her, and it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more, not one of you. The laugh's on my side. I've had the top of this business from the first. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me, if you please, or spare me. But one thing I'll say, and no more, if you spare me, bygones are bygones, and when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another, and do yourselves no good, or spare me, and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped now, for, I tell you, I was out of breath, and to my wonder, not a man of them moved, but all sat staring at me like as many sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again. "'And now, Mr. Silver,' I said, "'I believe you're the best man here, and if things go to the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it.' "'I'll bear it in mind,' said Silver, with an accent so curious that I could not for the life of me decide whether he was laughing at my request, or had been favourably affected by my courage. "'I'll put one to that,' cried the old mahogany-faced seaman, Morgan by name, whom I had seen in Long John's public-house upon the quays of Bristol. "'It was him that no black dog.' "'Well, and see here,' added the sea-cook, "'I'll put another to that by thunder.' It was this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last we've split upon Jim Hawkins. "'Then here goes,' said Morgan, with an oath. And he sprang up, drawing his knife as if he had been twenty. "'Avast there!' cried Silver. "'Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you were captain here, perhaps. By the powers, but I'll teach you better.' Cross me, and you'll go where many a good man's gone before you, first and last, these thirty year back. Some to the yard arm shiver my sides, and some by the board, and all to feed the fishes. There's never a man looked me between the eyes and seen a good day afterwards, Tom Mook, and you may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur rose from the others. "'Tom's right,' said one. 
I stood hazing long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I'll be hazed by you, John Silver. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? roared Silver, bending far forward from his position on the keg, with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at, you ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that once shall get it. Have I lived this many years to have a son of a rum punch and cock his hat thwart my ozure at the latter end of it? You know the way. You're all gentlemen of fortune by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cutlass, him that dares, and I'll see the colour of his inside, crutch and all, before that pipe's empty. Not a man stirred, not a man answered. That's your sword, is it? he added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're a gay lot to look at, anyway. Not worth much in a foot, you ain't. Perhaps you can understand King George's English. I'm captain here by election. I'm captain here because I'm the best man by a long sea moil. You won't fight as gentlemen of fortune should, then by Thunder Yellow Bay, and you may lay to it. I like that boy now. I've never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this ere house. And what I say is this, let me see him that'll lay a hand on him. That's what I say, and you may lay to it. There was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer, but with a ray of hope now shining in my bosom. Silver leant back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pike in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he had been in church, yet his eye kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tail of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together toward the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of their whispering sounded in my ears continuously like a stream. One after another they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall for a second on their nervous faces, but it was not toward me. It was toward Silver that they turned their eyes. "'You seem to have a lot to say,' remarked Silver, spitting far into the air. "'Pipe up and let me hear it, or lay to.' "'Ax your pardon, sir,' returned one of the men. "'You're pretty free with some of the rules. Maybe you'll kindly keep an eye upon the rest. This crew's dissatisfied. This crew don't valley bullying the marlin spike.' This crew has its rights, like other crews, I'll make so free as that, and by your own rules, I take it we can talk together. I ax your pardon, sir, acknowledging you for the captain at this present, but I claim my right, and steps outside for a council. And with an elaborate sea salute, this fellow, a long, ill-looking, yellow-eyed man of five-and-thirty, stepped coolly toward the door, and disappeared out of the house. One after another the rest followed his example, each making a salute as he passed, each adding some apology. "'Called into rules,' said one. "'Folks all counsel,' said Morgan. And so, with one remark or another, all marched out, and left Silver and me alone with the torch. The sea-cook instantly removed his pipe. "'Now look you here, Jim Hawkins,' he said in a steady whisper that was no more than audible. You're within half a plank of death, and what's a long sight worse, of torture. They're going to throw me off, but you, Mark, I stand by you through thick and thin. I didn't mean to, no, not till you spoke up. I was about desperate to lose that much blunt and be hanged into the bargain. But I see you was the right sort. I says to myself, you stand by Hawkins, John, and Hawkins will stand by you. You're his last card, and by the living thunder, John, he's yours. Back to back, says I, you save your witness, and he'll save your neck. I began dimly to understand. You mean all's lost? I asked. Ay, by gum, I do, he answered. Ship gone, neck gone, that's the size of it. Once I looked into that bay, Jim Hawkins, and seen no schooner, well, I'm tough, but I gave out. 
As for that lot and their council, ma me, they're outright fools and cowards. I'll save your life, if so be as I can, from them. But see here, Jim, tit for tat, you save Long John from swinging. I was bewildered. It seemed a thing so hopeless, he was asking. He, the old buccaneer, the ringleader throughout. "'What I can do, that I'll do,' I said. "'It's a bargain,' cried Long John. "'You speak up plucky, and by thunder I have a chance.' He hobbled to the torch where it stood propped among the firewood, and took a fresh light to his pipe. "'Understand me, Jim,' he said, returning. I've had on my shoulders, I have. I'm on Squire's side now. I know you've got that ship safe somewheres. How you done it, I don't know, but safe it is. I guess Hans and O'Brien turned soft. I never much believed in neither of them. Now you mark me. I ask no questions, nor won't let others. I know when a game's up, I do. And I know a lad that's staunch. Ah, you that's young, you might, you and me might have done a power of good together. He drew some cognac from the cask into a tin cannikin. Will you taste, messmate? He asked. And when I had refused, well, I'd take a drain myself, Jim, said he. I need a corker for this trouble on hand. And then, and talking of trouble, why did that doctor give me the chart, Jim? My face expressed a wonder so unaffected that he saw the needlessness of further questions. Ah, well, he did, though, said he. And there is something under that, no doubt, something surely under that, Jim, bad or good. And he took another swallow of the brandy shaking his great fair head like a man who looks forward to the worst. End of chapter 28《Treasure Island》by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 29 The Black Spot Again the council of the buccaneers had lasted some time, when one of them re-entered the house, and with a repetition of the same salute, which had in my eyes an ironical air, begged for a moment's loan of the torch. Silver briefly agreed, and this emissary retired again, leaving us together in the dark. "'There is a breeze coming, Jim,' said Silver, who had by this time adopted quite a friendly and familiar tone. I turned to the loophole nearest me, and looked out. The embers of the great fire had so far burned themselves out, and now glowed so low and duskily, that I understood why these conspirators desired a torch. About halfway down the slope to the stockade they were collected in a group. One held the light, another was on his knees in their midst, and I saw the blade of an open knife shine in his hand with varying colours in the moon and torchlight. The rest were all somewhat stooping, as though watching the manoeuvres of this last. I could just make out that he had a book as well as a knife in his hand, and was still wondering how anything so incongruous had come in their possession, when the kneeling figure rose once more to his feet, and the whole party began to move together toward the house. "'Here they come,' said I, and returned to my former position, for it seemed beneath my dignity that they should find me watching them. "'Well, let em come, lad, let em come,' said Silver cheerily. "'I've still a shot in my locker.' The door opened, and the five men, standing huddled together just inside, pushed one of their number forward. In any other circumstances it would have been comical to see his slow advance, hesitating as he set down each foot, but holding his closed right hand in front of him. "'Step up, lad!' cried Silver. "'I won't eat you. Hand it over, lubber. I know the rules, too. I won't hurt a deputation.' Thus encouraged, the buccaneer stepped forth more briskly, 
and having passed something to Silver from hand to hand, slipped yet more smartly back again to his companions. The sea-cook looked at what had been given him. "'The black spot! I thought so,' he observed. "'Where might you have got the paper? Why, hello! Look here now, ain't this lucky! You've gone and cut this out of a Bible! What a fool's cut a Bible!' "'Oh, there!' said Morgan. "'There! What did I say? No good'll come of that, I said.' "'Well, you've about fixed it now among you,' continued Silver. "'You'll all swing now, I reckon. What soft-headed lubber had a Bible?' "'It was Dick,' said one. "'Dick, was it? Then Dick can get to prayers,' said Silver. He's seen his slicer look as Dick, and you may lay to that. But here the long man with the yellow eyes struck in. "'Belay that talk, John Silver,' he said. "'This crew has tipped you the black spot in full council, as duty-bound. Just you turn it over as in duty-bound, and see what's wrote there. Then you can talk.' "'Thank ye, George,' replied the sea-cook. You always was brisk for business, and as the rules by heart, George, as I'm pleased to see. Well, what is it anyway? Ah, deposed. That's it, is it? Well, very pretty wrote, to be sure. Like print, I swear. Your hand a right, George? Why, you was getting quite the leading man in this ere crew. You'll be cap'n next, I shouldn't wonder. Just oblige me with that torch again, will yer? This pipe don't draw. Come now, said George. You don't fool this crew no more. You're a funny man by your account, but you're over now, and you'll maybe step down off that barrel and help vote. "'I thought you said you knowed the rules,' returned Silver contemptuously. "'Leastwise, if you don't, I do. And I wait here, and I'm still your cap mind, till you outs with your grievances, and I reply. In the meantime, your black spot ain't worth a biscuit. After that, we'll see.' "'Oh,' replied George. You don't be under no kind of apprehension. We're all square, we are. First, you've made a hash of this cruise. You'll be a bold man to say no to that. Second, you let the enemy out of this here trap for nothing. Why did they want out? I don't know, but it's pretty plain they wanted it. Third, you wouldn't let us go at them upon the march. Ah, we see through you, John Silver. You want to play booty. That's what's wrong with you. And then, fourth, there's this here boy. Is that all? asked Silver quietly. Enough, too, retorted George. We'll all swing and sun dry for your bungling. Well, now, look here, I'll answer these four points. One after another I'll answer em. I made a hash of this cruise, did I? Well, now, you all know what I wanted, and you all know if it had been done that we'd a been aboard the Spaniola this night as ever was, every man of us alive and fit and full of good plum duff, and the treasure in the hold of her by thunder. Well, who crossed me, who forced my hand, as was the lawful captain? Who tipped me the black spot the day we landed and began this dance? Ah, it's a fine dance. I'm with you there, and it looks mighty like a hornpipe in a rope's end execution dock. By London town it does. But who done it? Why, it was Anderson and Hans, and you, George, Mary. And you're the last above board of that same meddling crew, and you have the Davy Jones insolence to up and stand for captain over me, you that sunk the lot of us by the powers. But this tops the stiffest yarn to nothing. 
Silver paused, and I could see by the faces of George and his late comrades that these words had not been said in vain. "'That's for number one,' cried the accused, wiping the sweat from his brow, for he had been talking with a vehemence that shook the house. "'Why, I give you my word, I'm sick to speak to you. You've neither sense nor memory, and I leave it to fancy where your mother's was that let you come to see. See? Gentlemen of fortune, I reckon tailors is your trade. Go on, John, said Morgan. Speak up to the others. Ah, the others, returned John. They're a nice lot, ain't they? You say this cruise is bungled? Ah, by gum, if you could understand how bad it's bungled, you would see. Were that near the gibbet that my neck's stiff with thinking on it? You've seen em maybe hanged in chains, birds about em, seamen pointin' em out as they go down with the tide. Who's that? says one. That, ay, that's John Silver. I knowed him well, says another. And you can hear the chains a jangle as you go about and reach for the other boy. Now that's about where we are, every mother's son of us, thanks to him and Hans and Anderson, and other ruination fools of you. And if you want to know about number four and that boy, why, shiver my timbers, isn't he a hostage? Are we going to waste a hostage? No, not us. He might be our last chance, I shouldn't wonder. Kill that boy, not me, mates. And number three, wow, well, there's a deal to say to number three. Maybe you don't count it nothing to have a real college doctor come to see you every day. You, John, with your head broke, or you, George, Mary, that had the ague shakes upon you not six hours agone, and adds your eyes the colour of lemon peels to this same moment on the clock. And maybe, perhaps, you didn't know there was a consort coming, either. But there is, and not so long till then, and we'll see you'll be glad to have hostage when it comes to that. And as for number two, why, I made a bargain. Well, you come crawling on your knees to me to make it. On your knees you came, you was that downhearted. And you'd have starved, too, if I hadn't. But that's a trifle. You look there, that's why. And he cast down upon the floor a paper that I instantly recognised. None other than the chart on yellow paper, with the three red crosses that I had found in the oilcloth at the bottom of the captain's chest. Why the doctor had given it to him was more than I could fancy. But if it were inexplicable to me, the appearance of the chart was incredible to the surviving mutineers. They leapt upon it like cats upon a mouse. It went from hand to hand, one tearing it from another, and by the oaths and the cries and the childish laughter with which they accompanied their examination, you would have thought not only they were fingering the very gold, but were at sea with it besides in safety. "'Yes,' said one, "'that's flint for sure. J. F. and a score below, with a close hitch to it. So he ever done. Mighty pretty, said George. But how are we to get away with it, and us no ship? Silver suddenly sprang up, and supporting himself with a hand against the wall, Now I'll give you warning, George, he cried. One more word of your sauce, and I'll call you down and fight you. How? Why, how do I know? You had ought to tell me that, you and the rest that lost me my schooner, with your interference, burn you. But not you, you can't. You ain't got the invention of a cockroach. But civil you can speak, and you shall, George Mary, you may lay to that. That's fair now, said the old man Morgan. Fair, I reckon so, said the sea cook. You lost the ship, I found the treasure. Who's the better man at that? And now I resign by thunder elect whom you please to be your captain now. I'm done with it. Silver, they cried. Barbecue forever. Barbecue for captain. 
"'So that's the tune, is it?' cried the cook. "'George, I reckon you'll have to wait another turn, friend, "'and lucky for you, as I'm not a revengeful man. "'But that was never my way. "'And now, shipmates, this black spot. "'Tain't much good now, is it? "'Dick's crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, "'and that's about all. "'It'll do to kiss the book on still, won't it?' growled Dick who was evidently uneasy at the curse he had brought upon himself. "'A Bible with a bit cut out,' returned Silver derisively. "'Not it. It don't bind more than a ballad-book. "'Don't it, though?' cried Dick, with a sort of joy. "'Well, I reckon that's worth having, too.' "'Here, Jim, here's a curiosity for ya," said Silver, and he tossed me the paper. It was a round about the size of a crown piece. One side was blank, for it had been the last leaf. The other contained a verse or two of revelation. These words among the rest, which struck sharply home upon my mind. Without are dogs and murderers. The printed side had been blackened with wood ash, which already began to come off and soil my fingers. On the blank side had been written with the same material the one word, deposed. I have that curiosity beside me at this moment, but not a trace of writing now remains beyond a single scratch, such as a man might make with his thumbnail. That was the end of the night's business. Soon after, with a drink all round, we lay down to sleep, and the outside of Silver's vengeance was to put George Merry up for sentinel, and threaten him with death if he should prove unfaithful. It was long ere I could close an eye, and heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I had slain that afternoon, in my own most perilous position, and, above all, in the remarkable game that I saw Silver now engaged upon, keeping the mutineers together with one hand, and grasping with the other, after every means possible and impossible, to make his peace and save his miserable life. He himself slept peacefully and snored aloud. Yet my heart was sore for him, wicked as he was, to think on the dark perils that environed, and the shameful gibbet that awaited him. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 On Parole I was wakened, indeed we were all wakened, for I could see even the sentinel shake himself together from where he had fallen against the doorpost, by a clear, hearty voice hailing us from the margin of the wood. "'Blockhouse, ahoy!' it cried. "'Here's the doctor!' And the doctor it was. Although I was glad to hear the sound, yet my gladness was not without admixture. I remembered with confusion my insubordinate and stealthy conduct— and when I saw where it had brought me, among what companions, and surrounded by what dangers, I had felt ashamed to look him in the face. He must have risen in the dark, for the day had hardly come, and when I ran to a loophole and looked out, I saw him standing, like silver once before, up to the mid-leg in creeping vapour. "'You, doctor, top of the morning to you, sir,' cried silver broad awake and beaming with good nature in a moment. "'Bright and early, to be sure, and it's the early bird, as the saying goes, against the rations. George, shake up your timbers, son, and help Dr. Livesey over the ship's side. All are doing well, your patience was all well and merry.' So he pattered on, standing on the hilltop, with his crutch under his elbow, and one hand upon the side of the log-house, quite the old John in voice, manner, and expression. "'We've quite a surprise for you too, sir,' he continued. "'We've got a little stranger here, he <laughs> he a new boarder and lodger, sir, and looking fit and taunt as a fiddle. Slept like a supercargo, we did, right alongside of John. Stem to stem we was all night. Dr. Livesey was by this time across the stockade, and pretty near the cook, and I could hear the alternation in his voice as he said, "'Not Jim. The very same Jim as ever was.' 
said Silver. The doctor stopped outright, although he did not speak, and it was some seconds before he seemed able to move on. "'Well, well,' he said at last, "'duty first and pleasure afterwards, as you might have said yourself, Silver. Let us overhaul these patients of yours.' A moment afterwards he had entered the blockhouse, and, with one grim nod to me, proceeded with his work among the sick. He seemed under no apprehension, though he must have known that his life among these treacherous demons depended on a hair, and he rattled on to his patients as if he were paying an ordinary professional visit in a quiet English family. His manner, I suppose, reacted on the men, for they behaved to him as if nothing had occurred as if he were still ship's doctor, and they still faithful hands before the mast. "'You're doing well, my friend,' he said to the fellow with the bandaged head. "'And if ever a person had a close shave, it was you. Your head must be as hard as iron. Well, George, how goes it? You're a pretty colour, certainly. Why, your liver man is upside down. Did you take that medicine? Did he take that medicine, men?' "'Oy, oy, sir, he took it sure enough,' returned Morgan. "'Because, you see, since I am a mutineer's doctor, or prison doctor, as I prefer to call it,' says Dr. Livesey, in his pleasantest way, "'I make it a point of honour not to lose a man for King George, God bless him, and the gallows.' The rogues looked at each other, but swallowed the home thrust in silence. "'Dick don't feel well, sir,' said one. "'Don't he?' replied the doctor. "'Well, step up here, Dick, and let me see your tongue. "'No, I should be surprised if he didn't. "'The man's tongue is fit to frighten the French. "'Another fever.' "'Oh, there,' said Morgan, "'that comed of spilling Bibles. "'That comed, as you call it, for being arrant asses,' retorted the doctor and not having sense enough to know honest air from prison and the dry land from a vile pestiferous slough i think it most probable though of course it's only an opinion that you'll all have the deuce to pay before you get that malaria out of your systems camp in a bog would you silver i'm surprised at you you're less of a fool than many take you all around but you don't appear to me to have the rudiments of a notion of the rules of health. Well, he added, after he had dosed them round, and they had taken his prescriptions, with real laughable humility, more like charity school-children than blood-guilty mutineers and pirates, well, that's done for to-day, and now I should wish to have a talk with that boy, please. And he nodded his head in my direction carelessly. George Merry was at the door, spitting and spluttering over some bad-tasting medicine, but at the first word of the doctor's proposal he swung round with a deep flush, and cried, "'No!' and swore. Silver struck the barrel with his open hand. "'Silence!' he roared, and looked about him positively like a lion. "'Doctor!' he went on in his usual tones. "'I was thinking of that, knowing as though you had a fancy for the boy. We're all humbly grateful for your kindness, and as you see, puts faith in you, and takes the drugs down like that much grog. And I take it I found a way as'll suit all. Oh, kids, will you give me your word of honour as a young gentleman, for a young gentleman you are, though poor-born, your word of honour not to slip your cable?' I readily gave the pledge required. "'Then, doctor,' said Silver, "'you just step outside of that stockade, and once you're there I'll bring the boy down on the inside, and I reckon you can yarn through the spars. Good day to you, sir, and all our duties to the squire, and Captain Smollett.' The explosion of disapproval, which nothing but Silver's black looks had restrained, broke out immediately the doctor had left the house. Silver was roundly accused of playing double, of trying to make a separate peace for himself, of sacrificing the interests of his accomplices and victims, and, in one word, of the identical exact thing that he was doing. It seemed to me so obvious in this case that I should not imagine how he was to turn their anger, but he was twice the man the rest were, 
and his last night's victory had given him a huge preponderance in their minds. He called them all the fools and dolts you can imagine, said it was necessary I should talk to the doctor, fluttered the chart in their faces, asked them if they could afford to break the treaty the very day they were bound to treasure-hunting. "'No, boy, thunder!' he cried. "'It's us must break the treaty when the time comes. Until then I'll gammon that doctor, if I have to oil his boots with brandy.' and then he bade them all get the fire lit, and stalked out upon his crutch, with his hand on my shoulder, leaving them in disarray and silenced by his volubility rather than convinced. "'Slow, lad, slow,' he said. "'They might round upon us in a twinkle of an eye, if we were seen to hurry.' Very deliberately, then, did we advance across the sand to where the doctor awaited us on the other side of the stockade, and soon as we were within easy speaking distance, Silver stopped. "'You'll make a note of this here also, doctor,' said he, "'and the boy'll tell you how I saved his life, and we're deposed for it, too, you may late of that. Doctor, when a man's steering as near to the wind as me, playing chuck farthing with the last breath in his body like, you wouldn't think it too much, mayhap, to give him one good word. You please bear in mind it's not my life only now. It's that boy's into the bargain. And you'll speak me fair, doctor, and give me a bit of hope to go on for the sake of mercy. Silver was a changed man. Once he was out there and had his back to his friends and the blockhouse, his cheeks seemed to have fallen in. His voice trembled. Never was a soul more dead in earnest. "'Why, John, you're not afraid?' asked Dr. Livesey. "'Doctor, I'm no coward, no, not I, not so much.' And he snapped his fingers. "'If I was, I wouldn't say it. But I'll own up fairly. I've had the shakes upon me for the gallows. You're a good man and a true. Never seen a better man.' and you'll not forget what I done good. Not any more of you'll forget the bad, I know. And I step aside, see here, and leave you and Jim alone, and you'll put that down for me too, for it's a long stretch it is. So saying, he stepped back a little way till he was out of earshot, and there sat down upon a tree stump and began to whistle, spinning round now and again upon his seat, so as to command a sight sometimes of me and the doctor, and sometimes of his unruly ruffians, as they went to and fro in the sand, between the fire, which they were busy rekindling, and the house, from which they brought forth pork and bread to make the breakfast. "'So, Jim,' said the doctor sadly, "'here you are. As you have brewed, so shall you drink, my boy. Heaven knows I cannot find it in my heart to blame you.' but this much I will say, be it kind or unkind. When Captain Smollett was well, you dared not have gone off, and when he was ill, and couldn't help it, by George, it was downright cowardly. I will own that I here began to weep. Doctor, I said, you might spare me. I have blamed myself enough, my life's forfeit anyway, and I should have been dead now if Silver hadn't stood for me. And, Doctor, believe this, I can die, and I dare say I deserve it, for what I fear is torture. If they come to torture me— Jim! the doctor interrupted, and his voice was quite changed. Jim, I, I can't have this. Whip over, and we'll run for it. Doctor, said I, I pass my word. I know, I know, he cried. We can't help that, Jim, now. I'll take it on my shoulders. Holus bolus, blame and shame, my boy, but stay here, I cannot let you. Jump, one jump, and you're out, and we'll run for it like antelopes. No, I replied. You know right well you wouldn't do the same thing yourself, neither you nor squire nor captain, nor more will I. Silver trusted me, I passed my word, and back I go. But, doctor, you did not let me finish. If they come to torture me, I might let slip a word of where the ship is. For I got the ship, part by luck and part by risking, 
and she lies in the north inlet on the southern beach and just below high water. At half tide she must be high and dry. The ship! exclaimed the doctor. Rapidly I described to him my adventures, and he heard me out in silence. There's a kind of fate in this, he observed when I had done. Every step it's you that save our lives, and do you suppose by any chance that we are going to let you lose yours? That would be a poor return, my boy. You found out the plot, you found Ben Gunn, the best deed that you ever did or will do, though you live to ninety. Oh, by Jupiter! And talking of Ben Gunn, why, this is the mischief in person. Silver! he cried. Silver! I'll give you a piece of advice, he continued, as the cook drew nearer again. Don't you be in any great hurry after that treasure. Why, sir, I do my possible, which that ain't, said Silver. I can only, asking your pardon, save my life and the boys by seeking for that treasure, and you may lay to that. Well, Silver, replied the doctor, if that is so, I'll go one step farther. Look out for squalls when you find it. Sir, said Silver, as between man and man, that's too much and too little. What you're after, why you left the blockhouse, why you've given me that there chart, I don't know now, do I? And yet I done your bidding with my eyes shut, and never a word of hope. But no, this here is too much. If you won't tell me what you mean played out, just say so, and I'll leave the helm. No, said the doctor, musingly. I have no right to say more. It's not my secret, you see, Silver, or I give you my word, I'd tell it you. But I'll go as far with you as I dare go, and not a step beyond, for I'll have my wig sorted by the captain, or I'm mistaken. And first I'll give you a bit of hope. Silver, if we both get out alive out of this wolf track, I'll do my best to save you, short of perjury. Silver's face was radiant. You couldn't say more. I'm sure, sir, not if you was my mother, he cried. Well, that's my first concession, added the doctor. My second is a piece of advice. Keep the boy close beside you, and when you need help, hello. I am off to seek it for you, and that itself will show you if I speak at random. Good-bye, Jim." And Dr. Livesey shook hands with me through the stockade, nodded to Silver, and set off at a brisk pace into the wood. End of chapter 30「Treasure Island » by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter thirty one The Treasure Hunt Flint's Pointer Jim, said Silver when we were alone, if I saved your life, you saved mine, and I'll not forget it. I seen the doctor waving you to run for it, with the tail of my eye I did, and I seen you say no, as plain as hearing. Jim, that's one to you. This is the first glint of hope I had since the tack failed, and I owe it to you. And now, Jim, we're to go in for this here treasure hunting, with sealed orders too, and I don't like it. And you and me must stick close, back to back, like, and we'll save our necks in spite of fate and fortune. Just then a man hailed us from the fire that breakfast was ready, and we were soon seated here and there about the sand over biscuit and fried junk. They had lighted a fire fit to roast an ox, and it was now grown so hot that they could only approach it from the windward, and even there not without precaution. In the same wasteful spirit they had cooked, I suppose, three times more than we could eat, and one of them, with an empty laugh, threw what was left into the fire, which blazed and roared again over this unusual fuel. I never in my life saw men so careless of the morrow. Hand to mouth is the only word that can describe their way of doing. And what with wasted food and sleeping sentries, though they were bold enough for a brush and be done with it, I could see their entire unfitness for anything like a prolonged campaign. 
Even Silver, eating away with Captain Flint upon his shoulder, had not a word of blame for their recklessness. And this the more surprised me, for I thought he had never showed himself so cunning as he did then. "'Aye, mates,' said he, "'it's luck you have barbecue to think for you with this ere head. I got what I wanted, I did. Sure enough, they have the ship. Where they have it, I don't know yet. But once we at the treasurer, we'll have to jump about and find. And then, mates, it's that as the boats, I reckon, as the upper hand. Thus he kept running on, with his mouth full of the hot bacon. Thus he restored their hope and confidence, and, I more than suspect, repaired his own at the same time. "'As for hostage,' he continued, "'that's my last talk, I guess, with them he loves so dear. I've got my piece of news, and thank you to him for that. But it's over and done. I'll take him in a lime when we go treasure hunting, for we'll keep him like so much gold in case of accident you mark in the meantime. Once we got the ship and treasure both, and off to sea like jolly companions, well, then we'll talk Mr. Hawkins over, we will. We'll give him his share, to be sure, for all his kindness. It was no wonder the men were in good humour now. For my part, I was horribly cast down. Should the scheme he now sketched prove feasible, Silver, already doubly a traitor, would not hesitate to adopt it. He had still a foot in either camp, and there was no doubt he would prefer wealth and freedom with the pirates to a bare escape from hanging, which was the best he had to hope on our side. Nay, and even if things fell out that he was forced to keep his faith with Dr. Livesey, even then what danger lay before us! What a moment that would be when the suspicions of his followers turned to certainty, and he and I should have to fight for dear life! He a cripple, and I a boy, against five strong and active seamen! Add to this double apprehension the mystery that still hung over the behaviour of my friends, their unexplained desertion of the stockade, their inexplicable cession of the chart, or, harder still to understand, the doctor's last warning to Silver, look out for squalls when you find it, and you will readily believe how little taste I found in my breakfast, and with how uneasy a heart I set forth behind my captors on the quest for treasure. We made a curious figure, had any one been there to see us, all in soiled sailor clothes, and all but me armed to the teeth. Silver had two guns slung about him, one before and one behind, besides the great cutlass at his waist, and a pistol in each pocket of his square-tailed coat. To complete his strange appearance, Captain Flint sat perched upon his shoulder, and gabbled odds and ends of purposeless sea-talk. I had a line about my waist, and followed obediently after the sea-cook, who held the loose end of the rope, now in his free hand, now between his powerful teeth. For all the world I was led like a dancing bear. The other men were variously burdened, some carrying picks and shovels, for that had been the very first necessary they brought ashore from the Hispaniola, others laden with pork, bread, and brandy for the midday meal. All the stores, I observed, came from our stock. I could see the truth of Silver's words the night before. Had he not struck a bargain with the doctor, he and his mutineers deserted by the ship must have been driven to subsist on clear water, and the proceeds of their hunting. Water would have been little to their taste. A sailor is not usually a good shot, and besides all that, when they were so short of eatables, it was not likely they would be very flush of powder. Well, thus equipped, we all set out, even the fellow with the broken head, who should certainly have kept in shadow, and straggled one after another to the beach, where the two gigs awaited us. Even these bore trace of the drunken folly of the pirates, one in a broken thwart, and both in their muddied and unbailed condition. Both were to be carried along with us for the sake of safety, and so, with our numbers divided between them, we set forth upon the bosom of the anchorage. As we pulled across there was some discussion on the chart. The Red Cross was, of course, far too large to be a guide 
and the terms of the note on the back, as you will hear, admitted of some ambiguity. They ran, the reader may remember, thus. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the N of NNE, Skeleton Island, E, S, E, and by E, ten feet. A tall tree was thus the principal mark. Now, right before us, the anchorage was bounded by a plateau from two to three hundred feet high, adjoining on the north and sloping southern shoulder of the spyglass, and rising again toward the south, into the rough, cliffy eminence called the Mizzenmast Hill. The top of the plateau was dotted thickly with pine trees of varying height. Here and there one of a different species rose forty or fifty feet clear above its neighbours, and which of these was the particular tall tree of Captain Flint could only be decided on the spot and by the readings of the compass. Yet, although that was the case, every man on board the boats had picked a favourite of his own ere we were halfway over, Long John alone shrugging his shoulders and bidding them wait till they were there. We pulled easily, by Silver's directions, not to weary the hands prematurely, and, after quite a long passage, landed at the mouth of the second river, that which runs down a woody cleft of the spyglass. Thence, bending to our left, we began to ascend the slope towards the plateau. At the very outset, heavy, miry ground and a matted marsh vegetation greatly delayed our progress but by little and little the hill began to steepen and become stony underfoot and the wood to change its character and to grow in a more open order it was indeed a most pleasant portion of the island that we were now approaching a heavy scented broom and many flowering shrubs had almost taken the place of grass thickets of green nutmeg trees were dotted here and there with the red columns and the broad shadow of the pines and the first mingled their spice with the aroma of the others the air besides was fresh and stirring and this under the sheer sunbeams was a wonderful refreshment to our senses the party spread itself abroad in a fan shape shouting and leaping to and fro about the centre and a good way behind the rest Silver and I followed, I tethered by my rope, he ploughing with deep pants among the sliding gravel. From time to time, indeed, I had to lend him a hand, or he must have missed his footing and fallen backward down the hill. We had thus proceeded for about half a mile, and were approaching the brow of the plateau, when the man upon the farthest left began to cry aloud as if in terror. Shout after shout came from him and the others began to run in his direction. "'He can't have found the treasure,' said old Morgan, hurrying past us from the right, "'for that's clean atop.' Indeed, as we found when we also reached the spot, it was something very different. At the foot of a pretty big pine, and involved in deep creeper, which had even partly lifted some of the smaller bones, a human skeleton lay with a few shreds of clothing on the ground. I believe a chill struck for a moment to every heart. "'He was a seaman,' said George Merry, who, bolder than the rest, had gone up close and was examining the rags of clothing. "'Leastways, this is good sea-cloth.' "'Aye, aye,' said Silver. "'Like enough you wouldn't look to find a bishop here, I reckon.' But what sort of a way is that for bones to lie? Taint in nature. Indeed, on a second glance, it seemed impossible to fancy that the body was in a natural position. But for some disarray, the work perhaps of the birds that had fed upon him, or the slow-growing creeper that had gradually enveloped his remains, the man lay perfectly straight, his feet pointing in one direction, his hands raised above his head like a diver's pointing directly in the opposite. "'I've taken a notion into my old numbskull,' observed Silver. "'Here's the compass. There's the tip-top point of Skeleton Island sticking out like a tooth. Just take a bearing, will you, along the line of them bones?' It was done. The body pointed straight in the direction of the island, 
and the compass read duly, east-south-east by east. "'I thought so,' cried the cook. "'This here is a pointer. Right up there is our line for the pole star and the jolly dollars. But by thunder if it don't make me cold inside to think of Flint. This is one of his jokes and no mistake. Him and these six was alone here. He killed em every man. And this one he hauled here and laid down by the compass, shiver my timbers. Their long bones and their hair's been yellow. Ay, that would be Allardyce. You mind Allardyce, Tom Morgan? Ay, ay, returned Morgan. I mind him. He owed me money, he did, and he took my knife ashore with him. Speaking of knives, said another, why don't we find his lying around? Flint weren't the man to pick a seaman's pocket, and the birds, I guess, would leave it be. By the purrs, and that's true, cried Silver. There ain't a thing left here, said Mary, still feeling round among the bones. Not a copper Dwight? nor a backy-box. It don't look natural to me. No, boy, gum, it don't, agreed Silver. Not natural, nor not nice, says you. Great guns, messmates. But if Flint was living, this would be a hot spot for you and me. Six they were, and six are we, and bones is what they are now. I saw him dead with these here deadlights, said Morgan. Billy took me in. There he laid with penny pieces on his eyes. Dead? Aye, sure enough he's dead and gone below, said the fellow with the bandage. But if ever spirit walked it would be Flint's dear heart, oh, but he died bad, did Flint. Aye, that he did, observed another. Now he raged, and now he hollered for the rum, and now he sang fifteen men were his only song, mates. And I tell you true, I never rightly liked to hear it since. It was May not, and the windy was open, and I hear that old song a-coming out as clear as clear, and the death hall on the man already. Come, come, said Silver, stole this talk. He's dead and he don't walk, that I know. Least the ways he won't walk by day, and you may lay to that. Care killed a cat. Fetch a head for the doubloons. We started, certainly, but in spite of the hot sun and the staring daylight, the pirates no longer ran separate and shouting through the wood, but kept side by side and spoke with bated breath. The terror of the dead buccaneer had fallen on their spirits. End of chapter 31 Chapter thirty two The Treasure Hunt The Voice Among the Trees Partly from the damping influence of this alarm, partly to rest Silver and the sick folk, the whole party sat down as soon as they had gained the brow of the ascent. The plateau being somewhat tilted toward the west, this spot on which we had paused commanded a wide prospect on either hand. Before us, over the tree-tops, we held the cape of the woods, fringed with surf. Behind, we not only looked down upon the anchorage and skeleton island, but saw, clear across the spit and the eastern lowlands, a great field of open sea upon the east. Sheer above us rose the spy-glass, here dotted with single pines, there black with precipices. There was no sound but that of the distant breakers, mounting from all around, and the chirp of countless insects in the brush. Not a man, not a sail on the sea. The very largeness of the view increased the sense of solitude. Silver, as he sat, took certain bearings with his compass. "'There are three tall trees,' said he, "'about in the right line from Skeleton Island.' Spy glass shoulder. I take it means that lure point there. It's child's play to find the stuff now. I've half a mind to dine first. I don't feel sharp, growled Morgan. Thinking of Flint, I think it were, 
has done me. Well, my son, you praise your stars, he's dead, said Silver. He was a ugly devil, cried a third pirate, with a shudder. That blew in the face, too. That was how the rum took him, added Merry. Blue? Well, I reckon he was blue. That's a true word. Ever since they had found the skeleton and got upon this train of thought, they had spoken lower and lower, and they had almost got to whispering by now, so that the sound of their talk hardly interrupted the silence of the wood. All of a sudden, out of the middle of the trees in front of us, a thin, high, trembling voice struck up the well-known air and words. Fifty men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. I never have seen men more dreadfully affected than the pirates. The colour went from their six faces like enchantment. Some leapt to their feet, some clawed hold of others. Morgan grovelled on the ground. "'It's flint, by cried Merry. The song had stopped as suddenly as it began, broken off, you would have said, in the middle of a note, as though someone had laid his hand upon the singer's mouth. Coming so far through the clear and sunny atmosphere among the green tree-tops, I thought it had sounded airily and sweetly, and the effect on my companions was the stranger. Come said Silver, struggling with his ashen lips to get the word out. That won't do. Stand by to go about. This is a rum start, and I can't name the voice, but it's someone skylarkin, someone that's flesh and blood, and you may lay to that. His courage had come back as he spoke, and some of the colour to his face along with it. Already the others had began to lend an ear to this encouragement, and were coming a little to themselves, when the same voice broke out again, not this time singing, but in a faint, distant hail that echoed yet fainter among the clefts of the spy-glass. "'Darby McGraw!' it wailed, for that is the word that best describes the sound. "'Darby McGraw! Darby McGraw!' again and again and again, and then rising a little higher, and with an oath that I leave out. "'Fetch off the rum, Darby!' The buccaneers remained rooted to the ground, their eyes starting from their heads. Long after the voice had died away, they still stared in silence, dreadfully before them. "'That fixes it,' gasped one. "'Let's go!' "'They was his last words!' moaned Morgan. His last words above board. Dick had his Bible out, and was praying volubly. He had been well brought up, had Dick, before he had come to sea, and fell among bad companions. Still, Silver was unconquered. I could hear his teeth rattle in his head, but he had not surrendered. "'Nobody in this here island ever heard a Darby,' he muttered. "'Not one but us that's here.' And then, making a great effort, "'Shipmates!' he cried. "'I'm here to get that stuff, and I'll not be beat by man nor devil. I never was feared of flint in his life, and by the powers I'll face him dead. There's seven hundred thousand pound not a quarter of a mile from here. When did ever a gentleman of fortune show his stern to that much dollars? For a boozy old seaman with a blue mug, and him dead too.' but there was no sign of reawakening courage in his followers, rather, indeed, of growing terror at the irreverence of his words. "'Belay there, John,' said Merry. "'Don't you cross a spirit!' And the rest were all too terrified to reply. They would have run away severally had they dared, but fear kept them together, and kept them close to John, as if his daring helped them. He, on his part, had pretty well fought his weakness down. Spirit? Well, maybe, he said, but there's one thing not clear to me. There was an echo. Now no man ever seen a spirit with a shadow. Well, then, what's he doing with an echo to him, I should like to know? That ain't in nature, surely. 
This argument seemed weak enough to me, but you can never tell what will affect the superstitious, and, to my worry, George Merry was greatly relieved. "'Well, that's so,' he said. "'You've had upon your shoulders, John, and no mistake. "'Bout shipmates, this here crew is on a wrong tack, I do believe, "'and you come to think on it, it was like Flint's voice, I grant you, "'but not just so clear away like it, after all. "'It was like a somebody else's voice now. "'It was like a—' "'Boy, the powers, Ben Gunn!' roared Silver. "'Ah, and so it were,' cried Morgan, springing on his knees. "'Ben Gunn it were. "'It don't make much odds, do it, now?' asked Dick. "'Ben Gunn's not here in the body any more of Flint.' But the older hands greeted this remark with scorn. "'Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn,' cried Merry. "'Dead or alive, nobody minds him.' It was extraordinary how their spirits had returned, and how the natural colour had revived in their faces. Soon they were chatting together, with intervals of listening, and not long after, hearing no further sound, they shouldered the tools and set forth again. Mary walking first with Silver's compass to keep them on the right line with Skeleton Island. He had said the truth. Dead or alive, nobody minded Ben Gunn. Dick alone still held his Bible, and looked around him as he went with fearful glances, but he found no sympathy, and Silver even joked him on his precautions. "'I told you,' said he, "'I told you you had spoiled your Bible.' If it ain't no good to swear, boy, what do you suppose a spirit will give for it? Not that!" And he snapped his big fingers, halting a moment on his crutch. But Dick was not to be comforted. Indeed, it was soon plain to me that the lad was falling sick, hastened by heat, exhaustion, and the shock of his alarm. The fever, predicted by Dr. Livesey, was evidently growing swiftly higher. It was fine open walking here upon the summit. Our way lay a little downhill, for, as I have said, the plateau tilted toward the west. The pines, great and small, grew wide apart, and even between the clumps of nutmeg and azalea, wide open spaces baked in the hot sunshine. Striking as we did pretty near northwest across the island, we drew, on the one hand, even nearer under the shoulders of the spyglass, and, on the other, looked even wider over that western bay where I had once tossed and trembled in the coracle. The first of the tall trees was reached, and, by the bearing, proved the wrong one. So were the second, and the third rose nearly two hundred feet into the air above a clump of underwood a giant of a vegetable, with a red column as big as a cottage, and a wide shadow around in which a company could have manoeuvred. It was conspicuous far to sea, both on the east and west, and might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. But it was not its size that now impressed my companions. It was the knowledge that seven hundred thousand pounds in gold lay somewhere buried below its spreading shadow. The thought of the money, as they drew nearer, swallowed up their previous terrors. Their eyes burned in their heads, their feet grew speedier and lighter, their whole soul was bound up in that fortune, that whole lifetime of extravagance and pleasure that lay awaiting there for each of them. Silver hobbled, grunting on his crutch. His nostrils stood out and quivered. He cursed like a madman when the flies settled on his hot and shiny countenance. He plucked furiously at the line that held me to him, and from time to time turned his eyes upon me with a deadly look. Certainly he took no pains to hide his thoughts, and certainly I read them like print. In the immediate nearness of the gold all else had been forgotten. His promise and the doctor's warning were both things of the past and I could not doubt that he hoped to seize upon the treasure, find and board the Hispaniola under cover of night, cut every honest throat about that island, and sail away as he had first intended, laden with crimes and riches. 
Shaken as I was with these alarms, it was hard for me to keep up with the rapid race of the treasure-hunters. Now and again I stumbled, and it was then that Silver plucked so roughly at the rope and launched at me his murderous glances. Dick, who had dropped behind us, and now brought up the rear, was babbling to himself both prayers and curses as his fever kept rising. This also added to my wretchedness, and, to crown all, I was haunted by the thought of the tragedy that had once been acted on that plateau, when that ungodly buccaneer with the blue face, he who had died at Savannah, singing and shouting for drink, had there with his own hand cut down his six accomplices. This grove that was now so peaceful must have rung with cries, I thought, and even with the thought I could believe I heard it ringing still. We were now at the margin of the thicket. "'Huzzah, mates, all together!' shouted Merry, and the foremost broke into a run. And suddenly, not ten yards farther, we beheld them stop. A low cry arose. Silver doubled his pace, digging away with the foot of his crutch like one possessed, and the next moment he and I had come also to a dead halt. Before us was a great excavation, not very recent, for the sides had fallen in and grass had sprouted on the bottom. In this were the shaft of a pick broken in two, and the boards of several packing-cases strewn around. On one of these boards I saw branded with a hot iron the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. All was clear to probation. The cash had been found and rifled. The seven hundred thousand pounds were gone. End of chapter 32Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, read by Adrian Pretzelis, Santa Rosa, California, December 12, 2007. Chapter 33 The Fall of a Chieftain. There never was such an overturn in this world. All of these six men was as through as he had been struck, but with silver the blow passed almost instantly. Every thought of his soul had been set full stretch like a racer on that money. Well, he was brought up in a single second dead, and he kept his head, found his temper, and changed his plan before the others had had time to realize the disappointment. "'Jim,' he whispered, "'take that and stand by for trouble.' And he passed me a double-barrelled pistol. At the same time he began quietly moving northward, and in a few steps had put the hollow between us two and the other five. Then he looked at me and nodded, as much as to say, "'Here is a narrow corner,' as indeed I thought it was. His looks were now quite friendly, and I was so revolted at these constant changes that I could not forbear whispering, "'So you've changed sides again!' There was no time left for him to answer in. The buccaneers, with oaths and cries, began to leap, one after another, into the pit, and to dig with their fingers, throwing the boards aside as they did so. Morgan found a piece of gold. He held it up with a perfect spout of oaths. It was a two-guinea piece, and it went from hand to hand among them for a quarter of a minute. Two guineas? roared Merry, shaking it at silver. "'That's your seven hundred thousand pounds, is it? "'You're the man for bargains, ain't you? "'You're him that never bungled nothing, you wooden-headed lubber.' "'Dig away, boys,' said Silver, with the coolest insolence. "'You'll find some pig-nuts, I shouldn't wonder.' "'Pig-nuts!' repeated Merry in a scream. "'Mates, do you hear that?' "'I tell you now, that man there knew it all along. "'Look in the face of him, and you'll see it wrote there.' "'Ah, Merry,' remarked Silver, "'standing for a cutting again. "'You're a pushing lad, to be sure.' But this time every one was entirely in Merry's favour. They began to scramble out of the excavation, darting furious glances behind them. One thing I observed, which looked well for us, they all got out upon the opposite side from Silver. 
Well, there we stood, two on one side, five on the other, the pit between us, and nobody screwed up high enough to offer the first blow. Silver never moved. He watched them very upright on his crutch, and looked as cool as ever I saw him. He was brave and no mistake. At last Mary seemed to think a speech might help matters. "'Mates,' said he, "'there's two of them alone here. One's the old cripple that brought us all here and blundered us down to this. The other's that cub that I mean to have the heart of. Now, mates—' He was raising his arm and his voice, and plainly meant to lead a charge. But just then, crack, crack, crack! Three musket-shots flashed out of the thicket. Mary tumbled head foremost into the excavation. The man with the bandage spun round like a teetotum, and fell all his length upon his side, where he lay dead, but still twitching, and the other three turned and ran for it with all their might. Before you could wink, Long John fired two barrels of a pistol into the struggling Merry, and as the man rolled up his eyes at him in the last agony, "'George,' said he, "'I reckon I settled you.' In the same moment the doctor, Gray, and Ben Gunn joined us with smoking muskets from among the nutmeg trees. "'Forward!' cried the doctor. "'Double quick, my lads! We must head em off the boats!' And we set off at a great pace, sometimes plunging through the bushes to the chest. I tell you, but Silver was anxious to keep up with us. The work that man went through, leaping on his crutch till the muscles of his chest were fit to burst, was work no sound man ever equalled. And so thinks the doctor. As it was, he was already thirty yards behind us, and on the verge of strangling when we reached the brow of the slope. "'Doctor!' he hailed. "'See there! No hurry!' Sure enough, there was no hurry. In a more open part of the plateau we could see the three survivors still running in the same direction as they had started, right for Middenmast Hill. We were already between them and the boats, and so we four sat down to breathe, while Long John, mopping his face, came slowly up with us. "'Thank ye kindly, doctor,' says he. "'You came in and about the nick, I guess, from me and Hawkins.' "'And so it's you, Ben Gunn,' he added. "'Well, you're a nice one, to be sure.' "'I'm Ben Gunn, I am,' replied the maroon, wriggling like an eel in his embarrassment. "'And,' he added, after a long pause, "'how do, Mr. Silver? Pretty well, I thank ye, says you.' "'Ben, Ben,' murmured Silver, "'to think as you've done me.' The doctor sent back Gray for one of the pickaxes deserted in their flight by the mutineers, and then, as we proceeded leisurely downhill to where the boats were lying, related in a few words what had taken place. It was a story that profoundly interested Silver, and Ben Gunn, the half-idiot maroon, was the hero from beginning to end. Ben, in his long, lonely wanderings about the island, had found the skeleton. It was he that had rifled it. He had found the treasure. He had dug it up. It was the haft of his pickaxe that lay broken in the excavation. He had carried it on his back in many weary journeys, from the foot of the tall pine to a cave he had on the two-pointed hill at the northeast angle of the island, and there it had lain stored in safety since two months before the arrival of the Hispaniola. When the doctor had wormed the secret from him on the afternoon of the attack, and when next morning he saw the anchorage deserted, he had gone to Silver, given him the chart, which was now useless, given him the stores, for Ben Gunn's cave was well supplied with goat's meat salted by himself, given anything and everything to get a chance of moving in safety from the stockade to the two-pointed hill, there to be clear of malaria and keep a guard upon the money. "'As for you, Jim,' he said, "'it went against my heart. But I did what I thought best for those who had stood by their duty. And if you were not one of these, whose fault was it?' 
That morning, finding that I was to be involved in the horrid disappointment he had prepared for the mutineers, he had run all the way to the cave, and, leaving Squire to guard the captain, had taken Gray and the maroon and started, making the diagonal across the island, to be at hand beside the pine. Soon, however, he saw that our party had the start of him, and Ben Gunn, being fleet of foot, had been dispatched in front to do his best alone. Then it had occurred to him to work upon the superstitions of his former shipmates, and he was so far successful that Gray and the doctor had come up and were already ambushed before the arrival of the treasure-hunters. Ah, said Silver, "'it was fortunate for me that I had Hawkins here. You would have let old Long John be cut to bits, and never a thought, doctor.' "'Not a thought.' replied Dr. Livesey cheerily, and by this time we had reached the gigs. The doctor, with the pickaxe, demolished one of them. Then we all got aboard the other, and set out to go round by the sea for North Inlet. This was a run of eight or nine miles. Silver, though he was almost killed already with fatigue, was set to an oar, like the rest of us, and we were soon skimming swiftly over a smooth sea. Soon we passed out of the straits, and doubled the southeast corner of the island, round which, four days ago, we had towed the Hispaniola. As we passed the two-pointed hill, we could see the black mouth of Ben Gunn's cave, and a figure standing by it, leaning on a musket. It was the squire, and we waved a handkerchief and gave him three cheers, in which the voice of Silver joined as heartily as any. Three miles farther, just inside the mouth of North Inlet, what should we meet but the Hispaniola cruising by herself? The last flood had lifted her, and had there been much wind or a strong tide current, as in the southern anchorage, we should never have found her more, or found her stranded beyond help. As it was, there was little amiss beyond the wreck of the mainsail. Another anchor was got ready, and dropped in a fathom and a half of water. We all pulled round to Rum Cove, the nearest point for Ben Gunn's treasure-house. Then Gray, single-handed, returned with the gig to the Hispaniola, where he was to pass the night on guard. A gentle slope ran up from the beach to the entrance of the cave. At the top the squire met us. To me he was cordial and kind, saying nothing of my escapade, either in the way of blame or praise. At Silver's polite salute he somewhat flushed. "'John Silver,' he said, "'you're a prodigious villain and impostor, a monstrous impostor, sir. I am told I am not to prosecute you. Well, then, I will not. But the dead men, sir, hang about your neck like millstones.' "'Thank you kindly, sir,' replied Long John, again saluting. "'How dare you thank me!' cried the squire. "'It is a gross dereliction of my duty. Stand back!" And thereupon we all entered the cave. It was a large, airy place, with a little spring and a pool of clear water, overhung with ferns. The floor was sand. Before a big fire lay Captain Smollett, and, in a far corner, only duskily flitted over by the blaze, I beheld great heaps of coin and quadrilaterals built of bars of gold. That was Flint's treasure that we had come so far to seek, and that had cost already the lives of seventeen men from the Hispaniola. How many it had cost in the amassing, what blood and sorrow, what good ships scuttled on the deep, what brave men walking the plank blindfold, what shot of cannon, what shame and lies and cruelty, perhaps no man alive could tell. Yet there were still three upon that island. Silver, and old Morgan, and Ben Gunn, who had each taken his share in these crimes, as each yet hoped in vain to share in the reward. "'Come in, Jim,' said the captain. "'You're a good boy in your line, Jim, but I don't think you and me'll go to sea again. You're too much of the born favourite for me. Is that you, John Silver? What brings you here, man?' "'Come back to my duty, sir,' returned Silver. "'Oh!' said the captain, and that was all he said. 
What a supper I had of it that night, with all my friends around me, and what a meal it was, with Ben Gunn's salted goat, and some delicacies and a bottle of old wine from the Hispaniola. Never, I am sure, were people gayer or happier. And there was Silver, sitting back almost out of the firelight, but eating heartily, prompt to spring forward when anything was wanted, even joining quietly in our laughter, the same bland, obsequious seaman of the voyage out. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 And Last the next morning we fell early to work, for the transportation of this great mass of gold near a mile by land to the beach, and thence three miles by boat to the Hispaniola, was a considerable task for so small a number of workmen. The three fellows still abroad upon the island did not greatly trouble us. A single sentry on the shoulder of the hill was sufficient to ensure us against any sudden onslaught, and we thought, besides, they had had more than enough of fighting. Therefore the work was pushed on briskly. Gray and Ben Gunn came and went with the boat, while the rest, during their absences, piled treasure on the beach. Two of the bars, slung in a rope's end, made a good load for a grown man, one that he was glad to walk slowly with. For my part I was not so much use at carrying. I was kept busy all day in the cave, packing the minted money into bread-bags. It was a strange collection, like Billy Bones' hoard for the diversity of coinage, but so much larger and so much more varied than I think I never had more pleasure than in sorting them. English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Georges and Louises, doubloons and double guineas and moi d'ors and sequins and pictures of all the kings of europe for the last hundred years strange oriental pieces stamped with what looked like wisps of string or bits of spider's web round pieces and square pieces and pieces bored through the middle as if to wear them round your neck nearly every variety of money in the world must i think have found a place in that collection and for number I am sure they were like autumn leaves, so that my back ached with stooping, and my fingers with sorting them out. Day after day this work went on. By every evening a fortune had been stowed aboard, but there was another fortune waiting for the morrow. And all this time we heard nothing of the three surviving mutineers. At last, I think it was on the third night, the doctor and I were strolling on the shoulder of the hill where it overlooks the lowlands of the isle, when, from out of the thick darkness below, the wind brought us a noise between shrieking and singing. It was only a snatch that reached our ears, followed by the former silence. "'Heaven forgive them,' said the doctor. "'Tis the mutineers.' "'All drunk, sir,' struck in the voice of Silver from behind us. Silver, I should say, was allowed his entire liberty, and, in spite of daily rebuffs, seemed to regard himself once more as quite a privileged and friendly dependent. Indeed, it was remarkable how well he bore these slights, and with what unwearying politeness he kept at trying to ingratiate himself with all. Yet I think none treated him better than a dog, unless it was Ben Gunn, who was still terribly afraid of his old quartermaster or myself, who had really something to thank him for, although for that matter I suppose I had reason to think even worse of him than anybody else, for I had seen him meditating a fresh treachery upon the plateau. Accordingly it was pretty gruffly that the doctor answered him. "'Drunk or raving?' said he. "'Right you were, sir,' replied Silver, "'and precious little odds which to you and me.' "'I suppose you would hardly ask me to call you a humane man,' returned the doctor, with a sneer. "'And so my feelings may surprise you, Master Silver. But if I was sure they were raving, as I am morally certain one at least of them is down with fever, I should leave this camp, and at whatever risk to my own carcass, take them the assistance of my skill.' "'Ask your pardon, sir. You would be very wrong,' quoth Silver. "'You would lose your precious life, and you may lay to that. 
I'm on your side now, hand and glove, and I shouldn't wish for to see the party weakened, let alone yourself, seeing as I know what I owes you. But these men down there, they couldn't keep their word, no, not supposing they wished to, and what's more, they couldn't believe as you could. No, said the doctor. You're the man to keep your word. We know that. Well, that was about the last news we had of the three pirates. Only once we heard a gunshot, a great way off, and supposed them to be hunting. A council was held, and it was decided that we must desert them on the island, to the huge glee, I must say, of Ben Gunn, and with the strong approval of Gray. We left a good stock of powder and shot, the bulk of the salt goat, a few medicines and some other necessities, tools, clothing, a spare sail, a fathom or two of rope, and, by the particular desire of the doctor, a handsome present of tobacco. That was about our last doing on the island. Before that we had got the treasure stowed, and had shipped enough water and the remainder of the goat meat in case of any distress. And at last, one fine morning, we weighed anchor, which was about all that we could manage, and stood out of North Inlet, the same colours flying that the captain had flown and fought under at the palisade. The three fellows must have been watching us closer than we thought, as we soon had proved, for, coming through the narrows, we had to lie very near the southern point, and there we saw all three of them kneeling together on a spit of sand, with their arms raised in supplication. It went to all our hearts, I think, to leave them in that wretched state. But we could not risk another mutiny, and to take them home for the gibbet would have been a cruel sort of kindness. The doctor hailed them, and told them of the stores we had left, and where they were to find them. But they continued to call us by name, and appeal to us for God's sake to be merciful, and not to leave them to die in such a place. At last, seeing the ship still bore on her course, and was now swiftly drawing out of earshot, one of them, I know not which it was, leapt to his feet with a hoarse cry, whipped his musket to his shoulder, and sent a shot whistling over Silver's head and through the mainsail. After that we kept under cover of the bulwarks, and when next I looked out they had disappeared from the spit, and the spit itself had almost melted out of sight in the growing distance. That was at least the end of that. And before noon, to my inexpressible joy, the highest rock of Treasure Island had sunk into the blue round of sea. We were so short of men that every one on board had to bear a hand. Only the captain, lying on a mattress in the stern, and giving his orders, for though greatly recovered he was still in want of quiet. We laid her head for the nearest port in South America for we could not risk the voyage home without fresh hands. And as it was, what with baffling winds and a couple of fresh gales, we were all worn out before we reached it. It was almost sundown when we cast anchor in a most beautiful land-locked gulf, and were almost immediately surrounded by shore-boats full of negroes and Mexican Indians and half-bloods, selling fruits and vegetables, and offering to dive for bits of money. The sight of so many good-humoured faces, especially the blacks, the taste of the tropical fruits, and above all the lights that began to shine in the town, made a most charming contrast to our dark and bloody sojourn on the island. And the doctor and the squire, taking me along with them, went ashore to pass the early part of the night. Here they met the captain of an English man-of-war fell in talk with him, went on board his ship, and, in short, had so agreeable a time that day was breaking when we came alongside the Hispaniola. Ben Gunn was on deck alone, and as soon as we came on board he began, with wonderful contortions, to make us a confession. Silver was gone. The maroon had connived at his escape in a shore-boat some hours ago, and he now assured us that he had only done so to preserve our lives, which would certainly have been forfeited if that man with the one leg had stayed aboard. But this was not all. The sea-cook had not gone empty-handed. He had cut through a bulwark unobserved, and had removed one of the sacks of coin worth perhaps 
three or four hundred guineas to help him on his further wanderings. I think we were all pleased to be so cheaply quit of him. Well, to make a long story short, we got a few hands on board, made a good cruise home, and the Hispaniola reached Bristol just as Mr. Blandy was beginning to think of fitting out her consort. Five men only of those who sailed returned with her. Drink and the devil had done for the rest with a vengeance, although, to be sure, we were not quite in so bad a case as that other ship they sung about. With one man of the crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five? All of us had an ample share of the treasure, and used it wisely or foolishly according to our natures. Captain Smollett is now retired from the sea. Gray not only saved his money, but, being suddenly smit with the desire to rise, also studied his profession, and he is now mate and part-owner of a fine full-rigged ship, married besides, and the father of a family. As for Ben Gunn, he got a thousand pounds, which he spent or lost in three weeks, or, to be more exact, in nineteen days, for he was back begging on the twentieth. Then he was given a lodge to keep, exactly as he'd feared upon the island, and he still lives a great favourite, though something of a butt with the country boys, and a notable singer in church on Sundays and saints' days. Of silver we have heard no more. That formidable seafaring man with one leg has, at last, gone clean out of my life, but I dare say he met his old negress and perhaps still lives in comfort with her and Captain Flint. It is to be hoped so, I suppose, for his chances of comfort in another world are very small. The bar silver and arms still lie, for all that I know, where Flint buried them, and certainly they shall lie there for me. Oxen and wain-ropes would not bring me back to that accursed island, and the worst dreams that ever I have are when I hear the surf booming about its coasts, or starting up in bed with the sharp voice of Captain Flint still ringing in my ears, Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! End of chapter 33 and end of Treasure Island Fifty men on the dead man's chest Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum Yo ho and a bottle of rum Drink and the devil Yo and ho ho and, a of Yo and a bottle of rum Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum